Good morning and welcome to worship on this absolutely beautiful Sunday morning. The sun's out after a chilly day yesterday, rain and wind and everything. <laughs> Today's beautiful and uh, it is actually appropriate. It's the first Sunday in the season of spring. We are well in beginning the season of spring and next week of course is Hol- uh, Palm Sunday in the beginning of Holy Week. Easter is only two weeks away. Very exciting time of year to feel the effects of spring upon us. If you haven't already done so, take the friendship pad and register your attendance with us, especially if you're visiting with us. And uh, we just want to let, remind you that this is our last uh, Sunday, anyway, with the theme of meeting Jesus at the table. We'll pick the theme up again as we gather around the table Monday, Thursday. But uh, we've been that's been our theme through the season of Lent. As you hear the sound of those beautiful bells, and by the way, thank you for that beautiful uh, prelude, Eric. As you hear the sound of the bells, please stand for our call to worship. It is a good day to be here. It is a good day to give thanks. It is a good day to be in community. glory bright from light eternal bring in light thou light of life light's living spring true day all days illumine O holy son of heavenly love shower down thy radiance from above and to our inward hearts convey the holy spirit's cloudless ray O oh, joyful be the passing day with thoughts as clear as morning's ray with faith like noontide shining bright our souls unshadowed by the night O Lord with each returning morn thine image to our hearts is born no may we Please remain standing for our time to acknowledge our need for God's grace with our prayer of confession. First praying in unison and then pausing for a moment of silent and personal prayer. Let us pray together. Gracious God, giver of life and forgiver of sin, we come to you now with hope. Hope that you will always love us. Hope that you will not hold our sin against us. Hope that you will turn us around from what is evil toward what is good. Walk with us in this holy season and help us to look clearly at our lives and the world that we may embrace all with love. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, we have good news to share with one another this beautiful Lord's Day. The scriptures ask this question, who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And yet Christ died for us. 
Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Indeed, Christ prays for us. Whoever is in Christ, the old life is dead and gone, and the new life has begun anew today. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Okay, let us pray and we will close with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, we come to you this morning to worship you and to give you thanks and praise for all your blessings. As we move through these last few days of the season of Lent, we pray you would give us strength to stay with you on the journey all the way to the cross. May we never forget all you have done for us and for our salvation. We come to you today with concerns as well as joys. We see our fellow Americans suffering in the aftermath of terrible tornadoes in Mississippi and Alabama. May we respond as a nation and as concerned neighbors with help and support. May the one great hour of sharing and presbytery disaster assistance be a beacon of hope to people in need there and around the world. We pray for families we know and love who are facing their own time of crisis and concern. We pray for those who grieve the loss of a loved one, especially this week. We pray for the family of Alan Morjikian, and we honor his memory and give thanks for him and all in him that was good and kind and faithful in his service to this church. And for Jerry Hogan's mother, we pray for the, those facing surgery, especially Sue Brancotti. And we pray for all those that we name before you in our hearts now. We leave these names with you, knowing you care for them more than we ever could. So we pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And I'm reading from the NIV for a purpose that uh, I illustrate my first point here. Uh, the new RSV in front of you uses the word banquet, uh, or uses the word dinner, whereas the NIV uses the more traditional biblical language of banquet. And I want to make the point that we don't use the word banquet so much anymore. <laughs> so I went back and found my NIV. We'll read from that today. The parable of the great banquet. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I said, today's gospel story is known as the parable of the great banquet. As I, as I thought about it, the term banquet is not a term that we use that much anymore. I can't remember the last time I attended something called a banquet. It used to be more popular to call dinners for special occasions a banquet. Now we tend to call them a reception or a gala or a party or simply dinner. Well, when I use the words banquet, I remember the spring banquet at the little Christian college I attended in San Francisco. It was the big social event of the year. It would be held at a fancy San Francisco hotel and everyone was expected to get dressed up and have a date. And so it was stressful. And it was exciting at the same time. And Elizabeth would love to tell, you, uh, tell on me that I got into serious trouble at one of the spring banquets. <laughs> There's a group of us who decided that 2 a.m. curfew only applied if you came back to the dorms. If you stayed out all night, you weren't breaking curfew. So we went to the beach, and I got my guitar, and we made a bonfire, and we waited for the sunrise. We tried to sneak back in before breakfast, but we got caught. <laughs> in those days, in that little Christian college, it was scandalous for a mixed group to spend a night together anywhere. You can imagine, I almost fainted when my kids attended college, and not only were the dorms co-ed, but the bathrooms. <laughs> Times have changed, <laughs> mostly for the better. Whenever I hear the word banquet, I think of that infamous spring banquet. And by the way, Elizabeth was not my date that night, so she didn't get into trouble with me. But she was no goody to choose either, let me tell you. <laughs> this is the fifth story in our series, Meeting Jesus at the Table. Each week we have encountered Jesus both literally sharing a meal and then using food and the table as a metaphor for life lessons. This week is, in a sense, the pinnacle of Jesus' teaching at the table. Our first lesson, he was feeding the 5,000, uh, essentially an outdoor picnic. And there were other meals with tax collectors and sinners, as well as religious elites. But this parable is about a banquet, a feast, a fancy meal with formal invitations. It's known as the parable of the great banquet because it is often seen as a metaphor of the heavenly banquet which was prophesied to be at the end of time. 
The opening verse of this section sets the table for Jesus, pun intended, as one of the guests of the Pharisees' dinner made this observation. Blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus probably winced at this comment and thought, you arrogant, self-righteous, so-and-so. <laughs> you have no idea what you are talking about. The man who said this was likely himself a Pharisee because he was an invited guest at the home of a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the religious elites, the ruling class in first century Palestine. His comment was a smug reference to the belief that only those who kept the law of Moses would be worthy to eat bread in the kingdom of God in heaven. In other words, he thought he was on the inside track because he kept the rules and he enforced the rules on others. He thought he was righteous in the eyes of God, but Jesus saw him as only self-righteous in his own eyes. So rather than argue with him, Jesus said calmly, let me tell you a story. And thus Jesus told the parable of the great banquet. He began with these words, a, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and he invited many guests. Well, he got the attention of the Pharisee he was talking to and everyone else at the table with those words. They were invited guests at this dinner. They thought he was talking about them or people like them, the important people, the successful people, the outwardly religious people. The people gathered at that table would have been aware of the custom of invitations for a great banquet that was followed in those days, some of which is lost on you and me. We are familiar with invitations to events and we know how to RSVP, or at least we used to. I don't know about you, but I find it harder uh, to get people to commit to RSVP for events, especially here at church. There's also the trend of using online invitations or evites. Call me old-fashioned, but those kind of invitations are easier for me to lose track of. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. A paper invitation on the kitchen counter is a reminder to respond. Civu play. Let's think about that for a minute. <laughs> RSVP. The custom of that day, especially for an important meal or event, was basically a double invitation. The host would send out invitations through his servants and then expect RSVPs ahead of time. He needed to know how many people to provide for because it meant slaughtering the animal the day of the banquet. How many chickens or sheep or goats would he need to have to purchase and have prepared? If you were going to make excuses and not attend, now would be the time. We assume that the people, as you and I read this story, we assume that the people making excuses in this story were refusing the only invitation they had received. Hey, come to dinner, and they say, no, I can't. But in reality, they would have been people who had already said they were coming. The way a double invitation worked was the host would invite the guests, get RSVPs, and then, and only then, prepare the food and the location for the number of people. Once everything was prepared, then he sent out his servant again, because timing was not as precise as we like to be, to tell everyone it was time, everything was ready, time to come to dinner. And that is when these invited guests changed their minds and made excuses. Once again, we miss the depth of the rudeness of these excuses. The host made careful calculation how much food to prepare and especially, especially how many animals to slaughter. Remember, there's no refrigeration, so it needed to be eaten or thrown out. These people had accepted the invitation, which made the host prepare for them, and then they made their excuses. And what terrible excuses they were. One says, I bought a field and I need to go and inspect it. Another says, I bought a yoke of oxen that I need to take for a test drive. Or how about this one? I just got married. Blame your wife or husband, why don't you? <laughs> Those first two excuses are shallow and hollow. No one, even then, bought land or oxen without inspecting it ahead of time. But the real insult is to put material things, land and possessions, ahead of relationships with others. In these two excuses, I think there's a lesson for us, Americans who have a tendency to value productivity and success over relationships. 
How often have we chosen a, a work event over a child's school play or soccer game? Too often we make work and productivity the priority over the important people in our lives. I'll never forget an article I read in preparation for one of my first youth mission trips to Mexico back in the 90s. The author of the article had gone to Mexico to share his business skills to help small business owners become more successful. He was appalled one day when the owner of the auto, auto shop he was assigned to help closed his doors and went home in the middle of the day turning away customers. And the reason he did that was because an old friend had dropped in unannounced. And the shop owner was excited to see him, greeted him and said, you must come over to the house and see the family and stay for dinner. At first, the American consultant was shocked. He thought, how could you run a successful business this way? You could offend customers who were waiting for their cars and turn away others. But the next day he watched as customers came by and were totally understanding of the choice. Of course you needed to go home with your friend. My car can wait. The lesson was maybe we have something to learn from that culture and those priorities. People and relationships are more important than productivity and profits. And the other excuse that was used was just silly. I just got married. Well, of course you did. The whole village would know that and they would have celebrated with you. Now you should come and celebrate with us. But you refuse. How selfish is that? So in the parable, Jesus said the host was angry and told his servant to go invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. We cringe with the terminology, but notice it is the same list that Jesus gave in the earlier parable that we looked at last week. It was sort of a standard list that would be recognized by the Pharisees as the undesirables or the unclean. And you see, the sick and the poor were not seen as just unfortunate as we might see them. They were seen as cursed by God. They or their ancestors must have done something evil to deserve such a punishment in this life. The Pharisees did not look on these people with compassion. They could smugly behind, hide behind their theology and say they deserve it. We may think someone with a physical disability, we, may, we, we don't think that somebody with a disability deserves judgment anymore. Science has helped clear that up. But we can still blame the poor for being poor if we're not careful. As our cities are being overwhelmed with homelessness, I think there's starting to be a backlash against the poor and the homeless. The video of a San Francisco shop owner turning a garden hose on a woman who was sitting on the sidewalk in front of his business shocked us all. But I've noticed a shift in the rhetoric. A recent New York Times article on the homeless in Phoenix set a bias for the article by describing the most disgusting habits of some of the people out on the streets. I'm not saying I don't feel for those business owners who are suffering losses as customers stay away, but we need to be careful not to blame the victim. And Jesus challenged that worldview. In fact, this whole parable was a challenge to their worldview. The elites of the day thought they had an inside track, not only in this life, but in the life to come. They thought they were favored by God and invited to that great banquet. But in the last verse of the parable, Jesus turned it all upside down. The host of the banquet said, not one of those who was invited will get a taste of my banquet. Those who thought they were on the inside will be shut out, and those who were outcasts will be invited in. The challenge with the parables of Jesus is always to ask, where do we see ourselves in this story? Are we the poor and the lame, or are we the rich and comfortable who were too busy to respond to the invitation? If we're honest, most of us need to accept that we are on the comfortable side of the scale. And the question is, have we responded to God's invitation or do we make excuses? God has invited us to the great banquet, a, a banquet that will celebrate a new reality, a new equality, a new humanity. We are invited to go out and invite others to come in as well. 
Well, if you don't think you have received your invitation, check your inbox. It's there. It's up to you to RSVP and then to show up at the banquet where all will be fed. Amen. Let us continue to ponder on these thoughts from Scripture as ushers come to receive our tithes and offerings. Well, Jesus has a way of uh, getting our attention with those stories, doesn't he? Turns our world upside down at times to think well, the invited ones and the privileged ones are the ones who will be shut out and the ones who are outcast will be welcomed in. Let us go and look for those who need that invitation this week and be grateful for our invitation as well. And now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all God's people said. Amen. Thank you.